Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kelly Kistner. I'm an assistant director at the Undergraduate Research Center for the Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences here at UCLA. And I want to thank you all for uh, being part of our undergraduate research community and being with us today during our third virtual undergraduate research week. And although we've been holding these virtually now for three years, we are thrilled that this year we are back on campus and there have been opportunities for students to continue with in-person, remote and hybrid uh, research throughout the school year. And we're so glad that you could all join us today online. Also throughout this week, we're excited to highlight different research stories and perspectives from our alumni and faculty. And with that, I would like to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Alana Gerbiker. Uh, Alana obtained her BA in Middle Eastern and North African Studies from UCLA in 2011. And during her time at UCLA, she was a part of the Undergraduate Research Fellows Program. After completing her degree as a Presidential Scholar at the Harvard Divinity School, Alana lived in Morocco, Qatar, Israel, and Egypt studying classical Arabic, French, Hebrew, and Farsi. Currently, she is a PhD candidate in Islamic Studies at Columbia University with a focus on antinomian Sufism in Abbasid, Baghdad. Her work explores the embodied experience of Sufi men and women living in medieval Baghdad. How does the Sufi body change the city? And how does the city change the Sufi body? Drawing on contemporary critical theory and classical Sufi literary and theological texts, Alana is interested in bridging the divide between Islamic studies and anthropology, and she considers herself an ethnographer of texts. So please join me today in welcome, welcoming Alana Gerbiker. Hi, Dr. Kirsner. Thank you for that very generous introduction. I'm gonna share my screen with you guys and we're gonna start the presentation in one moment. The blank Word document and the blinking cursor in the midnight hours before a research assignment is due. What? is so awful and fear inspiring about the blank page. For my years as a professional academic researcher and part-time journalist, I think the answer can be summed up in one word, projection. The blank page is both canvas and mirror for the researcher, the space onto which we project all of our hopes for the future. I'll get tenure, I'll win a Nobel prize, I'll finally make my father proud, and all of our hidden shame. I suck, I'm stupid, I'll never get it right, I'm gonna be a failure, just like my father always said I would. Certainly, this inner monologue of fear, doubt, and self-hatred dogged my steps when I began my career as a researcher. In fact, the project that started me on my path in academia was at the same time the cause of the depression that bought my therapist second Porsche. My senior research thesis at UCLA presented for the first time at UCLA's Undergraduate Research Week, May 23rd, 2011, entitled A Historiography of Female Intellect in Islamic Legal Scholarship. This paper, which became my undergraduate research thesis, was a big hit. I was chosen as one of 14 undergraduate researchers in the country to present my research to Congress, and submitting it in my application packet helped me win the Presidential Scholarship at Harvard one of only two students in my incoming class to do so. Sounds great, right? Very fancy stuff. I wrote a research paper. I got a lot of awards. I spoke to Congress. I got a full ride to Harvard and then Columbia, all on the back of this one project. But that's the Instagram version of the story. The real story behind the promotional materials reads as follows. I am an immigrant from the USSR. My parents came here in 1989 when I was two years old. We had nothing, no economic capital, no social capital, and no understanding of how anything in America worked. Between us, we spoke maybe 20 words of English, including my dad's favorite phrase, very subversive in the USSR at the time, God bless America. But my parents did know the name of one American university, Harvard. Its fame had penetrated even behind the Iron Curtain. 
And they somehow got it in their minds that I, the firstborn immigrant daughter, would pay back their sacrifice of coming to America by going to Harvard. I hope you guys are familiar with uh, Luisa from Encanto because she's gonna be coming up a lot in this presentation as the firstborn daughter of an immigrant family. No pressure, mom and dad. I got you. I am absolutely going to go to Harvard for you. I will overcome abuse, gang-ridden public schools, anorexia, undiagnosed, untreated ADHD, depression and anxiety, because in Russia, we don't believe in therapy, just vodka. <laughs> Generational trauma stemming from the Holocaust and the crushing weight of your unmeetable expectations, and I will make your dreams come true. That is a lot of weight to put on one person, let alone one research paper. I'm sure all of us here today have felt the crushing weight of expectations around our research and our academic performance, whether our own expectations or those of our parents and communities. No wonder we procrastinate. No wonder the blank page fills our final week nightmares. Instead of being a joyful creative enterprise, which shockingly research can be with a different mindset, our academic writing can often be a source of dread shame, and in my case, lifelong physical pain. Hello, upper back problems. <laughs> now, I know that despite our differences in age and biography, I'm not the only person at this virtual research conference right now who's written an academic paper in the months, weeks, days, or let's be really honest, the caffeine and self-hatred fueled hours of pre-dawn before the paper is due at 9 a.m. <laughs> and look at this graph. 85 to 95 percent of students procrastinate. So you and me, we're in good company. But guys, I do want to know, where are the non-procrastinating 5 percent hiding? And can you please tell me your secrets? We here are not the only thinkers paralyzed on occasion by doubt, fear, and the crushing weight of expectation when we sit down in front of that most frightening of all things, the blank page and the blinking cursor. 60% <clears throat> of writers in a recent Harvard study reported feelings of shame, self-doubt, and self-hatred around their creative output. Rates of mental illness and alcohol abuse among artists and writers are so high that they're kind of a funny trope. Ha ha ha, hey that Van Gogh cutting off his ear. What a riot. When researching this talk, I was shocked, but also kind of felt like I was in good company to find out that the average creative worker spends 55 days a year procrastinating. If the feelings of shame, failure, self-hatred, and procrastination are familiar to you, as you embark upon your career as researchers, I'm here to reassure you. They are totally normal. It is okay to be freaked out or stressed out about academic writing. It's a scary thing to put yourself out there creatively, to be judged and criticized, and also to have the balls to make new knowledge. As one of my favorite writing teachers, Stephen Pressfield writes in The War of Art, it was easier for Hitler to start World War II than to face a blank square of canvas. This is because research, like any creative act, has the power to reveal and heal our deepest inner wounds. The process of sitting down and putting words or ideas to paper is at its core a process of self-revelation. And that revelation, which can be deeply upsetting, also holds the key for self-reflection and creative growth. The cognitive load of doing research, the trauma and insecurity that it unearths in us is doubly heavy if you're from a traditionally marginalized group for a couple of different reasons. One, lack of community support. Nobody around you understands what you're doing and why you're doing it. 
I remember telling an aunt that I was going to Morocco on a Fulbright fellowship to research urban mystics in the city of Fez. And she remarked, don't they still live in tents? Number two, there are few people who look like you in the scholarly community. You're a stranger in an elitist, upper middle class, often white male land. And finally, imposter syndrome. To put it simply, imposter syndrome is the experience of feeling like a phony. You feel as though at any moment you're gonna be found out as a fraud, like you don't belong where you are and you can only get there through dumb luck. As we can see from this chart, it can affect anyone, no matter their social status, background or skill level. I hope a few of you here are familiar with this feeling and I hope it's not just me. But what makes imposter syndrome especially difficult to deal with in academia is the expectation of expertise. We are all supposed to be the best in our field and the best don't talk about Bruno. Meaning we don't talk about our insecurities and hidden chains. We hide them away and leave them to fester and rot in the inner walls of our psyche. So <laughs> one night as I was procrastinating, which is so unusual for me, I came across this article in science.org about academia basically being a family business. There was something oddly healing for me in reading this article where we find out that kids with parents who are professors are 25 times more likely to become professors than the general public. The truth is academia is a rigged game. And this is a structural condition, not a personal failing. The great social theorist Pierre Bourdieu calls this kind of thing being native to the game. Kids of professors and upper, upper, other upper middle class white professionals have the social and cultural capital to play the academic game and win it. For the rest of us, the playing deck is stacked against us. However, I urge those of you who are entering into a life of academic research from a non-traditional background not to give in, not to give up. Not because I'm selling you some American dream hopium, because not everybody can make it. And there are no bootstraps in the world long enough to pull us up and out of the collective mess that we are in. No, I urge you, especially people like you and me who are not natives to the game, whose families maybe don't even get that there's a game being played. I urge you to keep at it. Your voices bring new questions and perspectives to academic research. Moreover, as I'm about to demonstrate, research can be an important healing and self-reflective modality. So it's vital to ask ourselves each and every time we sit down to write, why are we writing what we're writing? What is the greater purpose for ourselves, our families and our communities? Who can our work help? How can doing our work visibly and publicly inspire other new voices to do the research our world needs as it grows increasingly hot, flat and fascist? And I'm standing here today, okay, sitting, but you know what I mean, to tell you that despite our shared experience of shame, avoidance, and procrastination, there is a better, more honest way forward for us as academic researchers, writers, and intellectual creatives. What I like to call academic me-search. Now, what is this me-search I keep going on about? Me-search is a little bit like the matrix. Unfortunately, nobody can be told what research is. You have to find out for yourself. To help you find out what it is for you, I'm gonna show you what research has been for me. I'd like to share with you something extremely private, but also hopefully something that will help you as much as it helped me, a meditative practice centered around my work, which has freed me from some of the burden of shame and fear and procrastination. And when practiced regularly, has revealed to me the deeper meaning of both my creative academic work and my reluctance around it. I present to you my me search diary. A little bit of backstory. 
I began this diary during a period of intense mental and emotional turmoil. I was living in Cairo as a Harvard-funded fellow at the Center for Study of Arabic Abroad, also known as a CASA Fellow, America's most prestigious Arabic language fellowship. My move to Egypt left me cut off from my religiously Jewish family, who deeply disapproved, and caused my, at the time, fiance to brutally dump me right at the airport. I got to Cairo and entering a spiral, entered a spiraling depression so deep that none of my previous coping mechanisms seemed to work. I was unable to keep up with the advanced Arabic coursework and I was about to flunk out of the program. Desperate, I turned to several therapists for help and one of them suggested that I mindfully observe my inner dialogue while trying to read and write Arabic. What was the work bringing up that I wanted to avoid? And what you see before you, obviously raw and totally unedited, is the first day of my work diary a practice I have now kept daily for half a decade. If you skim it just a bit, <clears throat> you can see that nine comments out of 11 are negative judgments of the I suck and everyone else is so much better than me kind. Antonio, if you're out there, your Arabic is really, really good. <laughs> um, imagine willingly undergoing any activity with that much criticism comparison and should statements. Would you go on a date with someone who talked to you the way I am talking to myself? Would you be friends with them? Oh my gosh, you guys, why do we do this to ourselves? No wonder we procrastinate. But the process of writing out the thoughts themselves was a kind of healing modality, becoming aware of the critical inner voice and becoming curious about it rather than running away from it was the initial stage of freedom from it. You can kind of see that from this later diary entry where judgment begins to be balanced by self-awareness and fear starts to be balanced by compassion. Look at that second to last thought, if you will, to see a shocking idea. <laughs> <laughs> and Kanto really spoke to me, you guys. <laughs> so then what do I mean by me search? For me, me search starts by using a work diary, by reframing research as a meditative act where you spend time at the beginning of each writing session investigating the fear or resistance in a friendly way. What is this fear that is facing me? This fear, this resistance, can you name it? Can you find a place that you feel it in your body? It's usually my chest for me. Can you give it a shape, a form, a reason? Can you make friends with it and interrogate it in a compassionate way? Is it trying to protect you from something? From failure, judgment, shame, or criticism? Could it be your friend rather than your enemy? I believe that if we can start each writing session facing our fear and resistance and befriending it, we can not only overcome whatever is blocking us, rather this process can bring to the surface deep hidden wounds, repressed memories, suppressed hopes and squandered joys. Befriending and getting to know our resistance can mean befriending and getting to know deeply sublimated parts of ourselves, our inner children, our inner creative genius, whom we have cast aside in order to please our parents, our teachers, or our future employers. As my journey progressed, there were three books that really helped me push forward that I would like to share with you today. Note that these books are for writers and creatives more generally. They are not, thank goodness, written for specialists in academic research. That would be a snooze fest. <laughs> These books are Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, and Elizabeth Gilbert of Eat, Pray, Love, Fame, Big Magic, Creative Living Beyond Fear. These three books engage you from the standpoint of artistry. They assume that academic writing is a form of art, a creative, and potentially emancipatory undertaking. 
Understanding ourselves, not just as researchers, but as artists, can help us see academic writing as a creative, therapeutic meditation, a conversation with ourselves, rather than a competition with our colleagues or a Hunger Games style death match for a tenure track humanities professorship. In addition to my writing diary, I picked up a plethora of writing tips and tricks from attempting to potty train my toddler, henceforth affectionately known as the little monster. First of all, the little fear monster inside of us is very motivated by rewards. It loves candy and star charts and special treats. So I literally do these things for myself. Here is my star chart where I keep track of each day that I write. Um, May is looking too good, but I promised you guys I'd be honest, right? I have a reward system in my daily writing log on especially hard days. It's a little embarrassing to admit. <clears throat> I give myself a lollipop just for getting to my desk and opening the dissertation document itself. Yesterday was definitely one of those days. Um, second of all, the fear monster is easily overwhelmed and throws a tantrum if anything too big or too hard is expected to come out at any one time. So focus on small chunks of work or other things on a daily basis. My daily writing goal is 100 words a day or 15 minutes of dissertation work a day. Small chunks indeed. But because they're neither scary nor overwhelming, a hundred words a day has gotten me four dissertation chapters and five publications. Finally, there is nothing the fear monster loves more than hanging out with other fear monsters. When it's a group of toddlers, we call it a play date. When it's a group of academic researchers, we call it a writing accountability group. The only real difference between the two is that toddlers actually play on play dates. Whereas how much actual writing goes on in these alleged writing groups remains to be seen. As we come to the end of my talk, I want to come back to the beginning, which I botched. It was so much better in my head when I practiced it at home. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, but it happens. Um, the blank page and the blinking cursor on the night I first started preparing the speech, full disclosure, this part of the speech was written in my work diary because I was, surprise, procrastinating out of fear of your judgment and criticism. I opened my work diary and I asked myself, what is the purpose of this talk? What am I trying to tell my audience? I wanna let you know that you are not alone. You are not broken or defective or bad. Research is hard for everyone. And the difficulties increase exponentially based on your social position and family history. If you're struggling as an academic researcher or writer, it is not your fault. There are structural impediments to your excellence. And reframing your research as me search is one step on the path towards reframing both your relationship to your work and the biographical journey that led you to your academic interests. Prilat Savaran, the great French gourmand, once said, you are what you eat. As a researcher, in some very profound way, you are what you research. Your work springs out of you, inchoate and magical, carrying in its atoms the weight of the experiences which brought you to the page. Understanding the process of research and writing as personal, therapeutic, investigative, Understanding that the stakes are in here, not out there, can make research once again a task of love and remove the burden of fear that binds us. And as I come to the finish line of my first solo authored academic book, The Dreaming Disciple and the Sleeping Master, Sufi Dream Magic in Medieval Baghdadi Brotherhoods, forthcoming next December, I can tell you guys, it was worth it. Thank you so much for your time.
And thank you so much, Alana, for sharing your experiences, your honesty, and your guidance with us today. Um, at this point, I want to open up the, the remaining part of this session for Q&A. So please do, audience members, add your questions to the Q&A session segments that you see, and uh, I will go through and moderate. But I want to kick things off with a question for you, Alana, on um, so when you finished up your undergraduate research at UCLA or, or during the course of it, how did you decide that going to graduate school and continuing with your research was the right path forward for you? Yeah, I think there's a um, like a conscious motivation and a subconscious motivation. I think consciously I was like, oh, you know, I have this burning question about why women are allowed to be imams in Islam and not allowed to be rabbis in Judaism because I myself wanted to be a rabbi when I was a little girl, but I wasn't allowed to be one by my Orthodox rabbi. And I thought, I want to spend a good chunk of my life researching this question. Why didn't they let me in to the highest height of my religious authority? What is wrong with me that I couldn't be a rabbi? But I think subconsciously, you know, um, when you come to this country as an immigrant, there's an enormous belief in the American educational system. And I think in my family and many immigrant families, the more degrees you get, the better. Um, and getting a PhD really seemed like the pinnacle of what was possible for me in this country. That's great. Um, and we have a question from Sophia. How did you cope when a lot of other students got their BA and answered a nine to five rather than continued school and pursued academia? <laughs> um, very easy. <laughs> you know, I got paid to travel the world and study exactly what I wanted while my friends were stuck in offices. I have seen the sunrise over the deserts of the Sahara. I have stood on the pyramids as the Adhan calls. I have lived in Jerusalem as the sunlight touches the dome of the rock. I mean, it's been a really good life as a researcher. Oh, and all that was paid. <laughs> I was about to say, as a follow-up, perhaps you, you can speak to some of the, the various fellowships and grants and scholarship opportunities that you, you pursued and were accepted to uh, as some inspiration or things that students might look to um, in, in going along this kind of path, especially if it involves language training or uh, cross-cultural, cross-national training. Yeah, um, I, I don't want to go into it too much, although anyone who's listening to this talk, please email me. Um, I think my email address will be provided. Super happy to mentor you or provide any guidance, but I wanna give, excuse me, a general statement. If you're interested in a topic, there is money out there for you to study it. And if you think your work is relevant to a grant, there is money out there and people out there who want you to win it. Uh, the Fulbright, the Critical Language Scholarship, the FLAS Language Scholarship, and if you don't get it the first time or the second time or the third time, do not ask me how many times I applied for the Fulbright, keep applying, you will get it. So the general consensus is if you want to do it and you are persistent, you will get the money to do it. Thank you. And a question from Daniel. Uh, I know sometimes public schooling in the United States can be pretty rough. Were you supported academically during your time there to pursue higher education? Were there naysayers? Uh, it's getting real, real personal, but um, the first day of high school, 2001, September 2001, my dad brought me to school and told me he had served my mom with divorce papers. That was Monday. The next day was Tuesday, September 11th. <clears throat> that is how my high school year started. I had a really hard time freshman year. I went to public schools. Um, I basically get, got kicked out, um, went to another school, was still having a really hard time. And at the beginning of junior year, when I went to the school's college counselor, I don't remember her name, but I will never forget what she told me. She told me, you are not college material. You should consider applying to trade school. Well, lady, wherever you are, you were wrong. <laughs> Um, no, I, I was not supported. I think 
Unfortunately, um, the American public high school system has a really hard time dealing with trauma, with neurodivergence, and with students who don't fit a traditional path. And another question from Sophia, how flexible is the work life of a researcher? And perhaps you could also relate that to some of the, you know, you mentioned neurodivergence and coming from a background of trauma, like, and, and has that been amenable to, to you? Um, I mean, this will not surprise a lot of people in the audience, especially I know the UCLA undergrads. My parents did not want me to be an academic researcher. They wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. And I think, thank God, I didn't go those paths. I think the great thing about being an academic researcher is it's an incredibly flexible and forgiving path in some ways. Okay. So like, let's, let's, can you go into academia? and use it as a leisurely exploration of a thing you love and a way to get the support, the mental health services that you need to heal your trauma and deal with your neurodivergence and find workarounds? Absolutely. Will you necessarily get a job as a professor having taken that more leisurely neurodivergent path? Unlikely. Academia, like any other profession, has a kind of lockstep system. You know, you go from undergrad to a prestigious master's to a prestigious PhD, you have to publish or perish. That's, as you saw from my presentation, a lot of pressure. I couldn't do it. I am not gonna stand here and say, I made it. I am published and that's been great, but I am not going on to be a tenure track academic. I am currently teaching at a very good Florida pub, uh, private high school, St. Andrews. Um, and I am an adjunct at several local schools. For me, it's worked. As a neurodivergent person, I think the process of getting a PhD can be a great way to find out not just about what you're working on, but about yourself and why you're working it. And that's what it's been for me. Great, and, and congratulations on your new role, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> and your uh, completion of your dissertation as well. Thank I know you. it's coming up. Um, actually, uh, along those lines, perhaps uh, you could talk about how your research may have uh, lent itself to other types of, uh, of work um, or in non-academic uh, realms or, or things that you've considered uh, taking your, your kind of academic expertise towards? Yeah, um, so <laughs> I'm an expert in a very relevant and um, uh, how do I say sought after field, medieval Islamic mysticism, you know, the job offers are just <laughs> pouring down through my email box and through my LinkedIn profile. But um, on the way to getting this subject matter expertise, I have become completely fluent in Arabic, several forms of Hebrew, um, conversational, in Farsi, pretty fluent in French. Um, and I think there are very few, for example, consulting companies who work in the Middle East, um, government think tanks, whom I've worked for several, um, international publications that are not interested in somebody with that kind of deep field and language knowledge. And frankly, if I wanted to, I would be pursuing those opportunities, but I'm a 35 year old woman with two kids, a dog and a mortgage. <laughs> and after spending basically half my twenties moving from country to country in the Middle East and doing a lot of these roles, these think tank roles and um, working for various journals and magazines and newspapers, I'm ready to settle down. I was also wondering if you could speak to um, how students, especially undergraduates who might be intimidated by the prospects of, you know, reaching out to a faculty mentor, how might they reach out and, you know, how have you found it best to work on, um, you know, structuring the mentor relationship to get what you need out of it? So that's, an, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, and it's a really scary thing to do as somebody from a non-traditional background. Um, that's one of those things that's much easier if you are a native to the game you know how to talk to upper middle class professionals, you know how to email, you know how to structure the relationship. Um, and, you know, 
I think my advice for people who are struggling with that power differential and feeling very intimidated is speaking as somebody who's been a professor and who's currently a professor and is now a teacher, there's nothing we love more than if you come to us and if you say, I wanna research with you or I wanna do research or you know, can you tell me more about, I mean, like the day that that happens is a gold star day. And I come home running to my husband, my life has not been in vain. <laughs> um, and let's say, you know, maybe your email isn't perfectly structured or let's say you come to my door and you forget to say hello and your shoes are dirty and you feel, you know, I don't know, uncomfortable in, in that relationship. Whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever discomfort or insecurity really truly is dwarfed by the enormous joy that the professor you are coming to feels in you coming to them and asking them about research. This is our raison d'etre. This is why we do the work that we do. So come to us, however you come to us, we will be thrilled that you're at our door. Yes, I think that's a, a wonderful sentiment to, to reiterate. Please don't be afraid, students. Come to office hours. Doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter if you're just, you know, thinking about some ideas. Um, all right, a message actually from from Alex Woodman, who knows you. Um, uh, I don't know if you're able to talk on here, Alex, but I'll re re reiterate to you. Alana, congratulations. So many years passed from SMC and UCLA years, but you stayed as radiant and bright as you were years ago. We took a few classes together. It's great to see fellow classmates being very successful. Truly happy uh -huh. for you. Thank you very much. Yeah, very thank nice. you, Alex. Um, and Sophia asked, do you have any notable professors or mentors you would like to shout out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Michael Maroney, I think he's a professor emeritus here at um, UCLA. Uh, Scott Barchi, also professor emeritus at UCLA. These are two, you know, and um, I like I say this lovingly, like older white men, Ivy League educated, you know, they are the man or the institution in some very scary way to me, who completely took me under their wing. They saw this like, little like enthusiastic ooh history <laughs> ooh religion um girl and they were like you know i see potential in you and professor maroney put me as a what is it like a second semester junior or a second quarter junior into one of his graduate courses and he was like you you have the potential to do this and you know what i did i did well in that graduate course and that coursework is what led me to my research thesis which led me to my master's thesis which led me to my phd um so you guys who are listening, you know, from UCLA, the professors there are awesome, regardless of their social position or like the prestige of their PhDs, they really want to help you up. And that was my experience. Great. And another question about, you know, finding a, the research question or narrowing down just a measurable number of research interests into something that's manageable. I know that's something that students really struggle with because you know often you guys are so passionate um, about so many things. What advice do you give to students? So fortunately or unfortunately, my advice is really process oriented, which is that as you write, the central question will emerge. Guys, the central question of my dissertation didn't emerge until the fourth chapter. It took me that long. It took me years of writing until I had the question that would bring my dissertation to a focus. And the same is gonna happen with you. All right, you have a million research questions, awesome. My suggestion is write them down, start the research, start going in a direction. And as you go in the direction, something will appear that is really burning to you so for example, in my dissertation, I'm really fascinated by the way that Sufis take the dream realm completely seriously. For a Sufi Sheikh, a dream is more real than this reality. And things that are done or said in dreams have real world effects on Islamic legal precedent, for example. And I have cool dreams. Are dreams really this other realm that I get to explore? Do my dreams affect not just me personally, but like, larger political and institutional possibilities, I really want to find out about that. And that's the question that it took me four chapters to realize my dissertation was about. But that will happen to you too. 
as you write, the question will emerge. And is that also uh, what your forthcoming book is about? Is it the same research as your dissertation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to remind us of uh, the, the title again and when it's coming out? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I didn't want to be arrogant and be like, hey, guys, read my book. But read my book when it comes out next December. <laughs> the Dreaming Disciple and the Sleeping Master, Sufi Dream Magic in Medieval Baghdadi Brotherhoods. So look for that uh, in December from what, what press is that? Rutledge. Rutledge, great. Who also published my first book. Yes, and if you guys have questions about publication, Come on at me. <laughs> uh, also, another question on: uh, Do you personally think there are any topics oversaturated in the history field, uh, such as more Eurocentric history? You know, I don't know about oversaturation because I'm a big believer in writing from the margins, or what's called people's history. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of research on the kings and nobles and aristocrats of. 17th and 18th century Europe, but not enough on slaves, indentured servants, midwives, magicians. Um, no, I don't believe any topic has been saturated. I think that finally in this era of historical research, the people on the margins, the people who live history are being accorded their voice in the historical record. And that's a very important part of what I do. Um, I study antinomian Sufis, so kind of like, uh, you know, Sufis that were rejected by other Sufis. I study female Sufis. I study Jewish Sufis. I'm very interested in how the voices from the margin create the center. I think any historical set of questions that asks, how are these people who aren't necessarily centered in the archive coming to be agents in history is going to be a great project. Great. Um somewhat along those lines. I was wondering about what motivated you to start studying religion. You mentioned you were you were interested at one point in being a, a rabbi or why you couldn't be a rabbi. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what keeps you motivated and, and maybe in what ways you think of your role today as similar or different from if you were a rabbi. Yeah, if I were a rabbi, um, why did I wanna be a rabbi? Um, have you ever heard that Groucho Marx joke? I never want to be a club of, I want to never want to be a member of any club that would have me as a member. I think it was a little bit like that with me and being a rabbi and being a woman in Orthodox Judaism. I sort of knew like, oh, they don't really like, there's not a lot of necessarily respect for female intellectual capacity in this tradition, but I'm doing the Hebrew as well as the boys. And I'm doing the Rashi as well as the boys. And I have the text memorized as well as the boys. Give me authority. <laughs> you know. So, and I was really young with this. I was like eight. You know, and I, I went to my rabbi, who now, ironically, Rabbi Landis is the Rosh Hashiva Pardes and one of the most important voices in ordaining Jewish rabbis. History is a <clears throat> is a, a jokester sometimes. And when he told me, you know, you can be a rabbi's wife. Um, I was devastated, but also really motivated. I mean, I, I, I understand this now because as you really, you know, beautifully put it, in some ways, an academic of religion is the closest thing you can be to a priest or a rabbi in the secular world. So yeah, very, you know, very um, astutely you realize that I did get to fulfill that original desire um, of bringing a beautiful tradition to people in what I hope is a meaningful way. Um, why Islam? Because as I found out in my undergraduate research thesis, um, Islam has a lot of leeway for female intellectual capacity. In Islam, women are accorded certain rights and privileges as thinkers, as judges, as writers, as creators of legal precedent. That has not been the case for Orthodox Judaism. Um, and what keeps me motivated, again, I, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but I really hope to one day bring my research to the public platform. You know, I really hope there's this wonderful, she's kind of called the popularizer of religion. Um, guys, if you guys want to be scholars of religion, never tell anyone you want to be a popularizer. <laughs> Her name is Karen Armstrong. And during one of my PhD interviews, I did not get in at this university. Um, 
I said, I wanted to be the Karen Armstrong of Sufism. I want to bring this really interesting and rich tradition to a popular audience. And I think give me five or 10 years and I'm going to be able to do that. I think this dissertation and these publications that I have in the pipeline are the beginning of what's going to be a life of dedication to a group of people that carry immense potential for us as we restructure our dreams and our enchanted possibilities and our relationship with the ineffable divine. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, well we're certainly looking forward to, to following your career towards that. Um, <clears throat> another great question from Sophia. Uh, did you take any gap years during your academic career, or have to work in another market to support your academic career? Um, uh, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the truth is, if I have any true gift in life, it's getting academic and government institutions to give me money to do my <laughs> So luckily, no, I, I um, you know, so I didn't go to college right away. I took two years to work. Um, my family needed the money and you can, you know, necessarily pay for college. And um, I then went to community college, then UCLA, then Harvard, um, all funded. And then I did a fellowship in Qatar and a fellowship in Israel, and these were paid fellowships. Um, you can call them gap years. So like those of you who are gonna be doing, you know, intensive language research, those are gaps from being in a traditional institution. You're not gonna be getting necessarily masters or PhD level credits. So yes, I took gap years to study language, but um, no, I didn't, really work at anything except my research because you know part of that work was writing the grants that allowed me to then study languages um, which I recognize as a privilege um, and if any of you guys need any help with writing these grants or finding them please reach out to me I would love to help you And we have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions from the audience but um, uh, while those come in, or if any come in, I wanted to ask you about um, how do you manage uh, or tips on managing being an academic and, and going through graduate school with a, and well and undergrad with a with a family and children. Um, tips: um, a really supportive husband, <laughs> a really supportive husband whose mother was an academic and who deeply get like he's with my toddler right now. Um, other tips don't do it. I, mean, no, I, mean, I, I, okay. Full disc. I would not be the scholar I am today without my kids. My kids literally get me up in the morning, not just because, you know, mommy, um, but because one of the things that gets me through writing this dissertation is knowing that one day my kids are going to see it and they're going to see my book on my shelf and they're going to say, mommy, what is this? And I'm gonna say, that's a book that mommy wrote and you can do it too. And I think especially as a first generation immigrant from a non-traditional background, that is such a powerful gift to be able to give my kids. You can do it too. That's something that I hope I was able to give you guys as my audience and what I hope to give my students as I go teach next year. Like guys, seriously, if I can do it, you can do it too. And I don't see any more questions coming in, but I want to thank all of you for uh, being in the audience today and sharing your questions. And I especially want to thank you, Alana, for your time and for sharing your honest experience and your guidance for mm -hmm. our, our audience and our, our students here at UCLA. Um, we're so grateful for you sharing your story. And I know it means a lot to, to those who have been able to hear it. Um, I also want to thank all of the Undergraduate Research Week community and the staff, faculty, and supporters of Undergraduate Research Week and the Undergraduate Research Centers for making uh, all of the Undergraduate Research Week events, including this one, possible. Um, and with that, I want to say, yeah, please look out for Alana's uh, 
book coming into summer, December in route from Routledge Press. And if there are no other questions, I think we'll turn it back over to the college. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you, Diane. Bye.